Hello and thank you for watching my video. My name is Astrid Krasnici. I'm CCNA and CCMP certified instructor. On this video, we are covering CCNA semester 4, Connecting Networks. This is chapter 3, Point-to-Point -point Connections. Chapter 3, Point-to-Point -point Connections, Overview. This is section 3.1, Serial Point-to-Point -point Overview. In this section, we explain the fundamentals of point-to-point -point serial communication across a wide area network, then we configure HDLC encapsulation on a point-to-point -point serial network or serial link. Then we should be able to describe the benefits of using point-to-point -point protocol over HDLC in a wide area network and be able to explain the fundamentals of point-to-point -point serial communication across a wide area network. Section 3.1 Serial Point-to-Point -point Overview Serial and Parallel Ports one of the most common types of wide area network connection is the point-to-point -point connections. Point-to-point -point connections are used to connect LANs to service provider wide area network. So we connect our local area network to the service provider wide area network and to connect local area network segments within an enterprise network. A LAN to one point-to-point -point connection is also referred to as a serial connection or a least line connection. Understanding how point-to-point -point serial connections or serial communication across a least line works is important to an overall understanding of how wide area network functions. Communications across a serial connection is a method of data transmissions in which the bits are transmitted sequently over a single channel. This is equivalent to a pipe only wide enough to fit one ball at a time. Some multiple balls can only go into the pipe but only one at the time and they only have one exit point the other end of the pipe a serial point port is bidirectional and often referred to as a bidirectional port or a communication port serial and parallel port this in a contract to parallel communication in which bits can be transmitted simultaneously over multiple wires so here on the top you can see that's a serial communication and underneath is a parallel communication so parallel connections theoretically transfer data eight times faster than a serial connections. So because it's transmitting eight bits at, at the same time as a serial communication is transferring one bit. So obviously eight times faster than the serial port. But parallel port is being deprecated or is phase, being phased out while the serial port has gained in the popularity. Why do you think? Why do we use one bit at a time is better than sending eight bits at a time? Well, if we send that 8 bits at a time, it causes a few problems. The first problem is a crosstalk. These wires, longer the wires increase, they will be able to, uh, for example, crosstalk uh, one bit going to the other wire and so on. They will be able to uh, issues like that, the, the corruption of zeros and ones. So longer the wire is, uh, more, more uh, uh, prone to crosstalk. As well as another problem is the clock skew. Clock skew meaning that we are not, if we send eight bits at the time, it doesn't mean that at the end they're gonna receive same eight bits. Maybe one of the wires is bit maybe broken or something, then one of the bits is lagging behind, and the other side has to wait until all, all eight bits they come in. So that's why sometimes, or most of the time, the parallel port is gonna be slower than the serial communications. And the problem with the parallel communication is that it's one direction meaning that you can just send. You can't just send and receive at the same time. So it's only outbound communication like from the hard drive. So serial communication, data is encapsulated by the uh, communication protocol used by the sending router. The encapsulated frame is sent on the physical medium to the wide area network. There are various ways to tra traverse the wide area network, but the receiver router will use the same communication protocol to de-encapsulate the frame when it arrives. There are three important serial communication standards affecting LAN to the wide area network connections. First is RS-232. This is the most of the back of the computers that will have this port, serial port, that's RS-232. You connect your console cable to that port. Most serial ports on the personal computers conform, conform to the RS-232C or newer RS-422 or RS-423 standards. They have both 9-pin and 25-pin connectors they are used. Most of them 
that you see and me I see at the back of the computers they have a 9 pin port if you have serial ports newer computers they don't even have the serial port it will go to the USB USB communication is serial communication so there's a there's conversions you can buy there that will convert your USB port to the 9 pin serial port a serial port is a general general purpose interface that can be used for almost any type of devices including modems, mice and printers. These types of peripheral devices for computers have been replaced by new and faster standards like USB, but many network devices they still use RJ45 connectors. Then we have a V35, typically used for modem to multiplexer communication. This ITU standard for high-speed synchronous data exchange combines the bandwidth of several telephone circuits. Or we have a HSSI or high-speed serial interface that supports transmission rate up to 52 megabits per second. Point-to-point -point communication links. When a permanent dedicated connections are required, a point-to-point -point link is used to provide a single pre-established wide area network communication path from the customer premises through the provider's network to a remote destination. So point to point, when we send data from here, from this router, it goes on the cloud. We don't really care what happens in the cloud, but it's like a tunnel that goes on the exit point is here on this side. A point to point link can connect two geographically distant sites, such as a corporate office on the New York in New York and a regional office in London. For a point to point line, the carrier dedicates specific resources for a line that is leased by the customer, leased line. Point-to-point -point connections are not limited to connections that are across the land. There are hundreds of thousands of miles of undersea fiber optic cables that connect countries and continents worldwide. The dedicated capacity remove latency or jitter between the endpoints, essential for some applications such as voice over IP or video over IP. Time division multiplexing. Multiplexing refers to a scheme that allows multiple logical signals that to share a sig single physical channel. For example, we can send different kind of signals on the one link only. Imagine you have one cable and what type of data goes through. Now, if you want, for example, for example, you want to send data, voice and video, you would have to have three links. Instead of having three, we can have one link and the only one link is possible because you use this time division multiplexing. Time division multiplexing is separates time, cuts time for each type of data. So you have one slot for data, one slot for voice, one slot for video, and then we send them over one link. So that uh, allows multiple different type of signals. These are called logical signals. It's like when you think of your PC. You know, you open your, I don't know, YouTube, you, you are looking at your emails, you are maybe watching a movie or listening to music, another YouTube channel and all that. That doesn't mean that you have so many processes. So if you have, example, maybe you have Joule or Quad Core or whatever, but think of one processor. If we used, long time ago, we only had one processor. That processor was running something called time division multiplexing. To you and me, it looks like there's like simultaneously we have in everything running. And we are, but in reality, what the processor is doing or your CPU is doing is dividing time. It's like serving one processor one second, uh, tiny milliseconds or whatever, and another processor at other time. Two common types of multiplexing we have are time division multiplexing and statistical time division multiplexing or SDDM. Time division multiplexing is being invented by lab uh, Bell Laboratories originally invented by TDM to maximize the amount of voice traffic carried over a medium. Before multiplexing, each telephone call required its own physical link. This was expensive and unscalable solution. Imagine if you had like, I don't know, thousand phones at your company, you would have to have 1000 cables. So over TDM, we can have one cable and that cable will be able to service or lodge all our logical phone lines. TDM divides the bandwidth of a single link into separate time slots. TDM transmit two or more channels data stream over the same link by allocating a different time slot for the transmission of each channel. In effect, the channel takes turns using the link. Statistical time division multiplexing. Think about this. 
In analogy, compare the TDM to train within 32 railroads cars. So it has 32 carriages. Each car is owned by a different company and every day the train leaves with 32 cars attached. If one of the companies has cargo to send, great, the, cargo is, the car is loaded. If the company has nothing to send, the car remains empty but stays on the train. Ship, shipping empty containers, it is not very efficient. The TDM shares this inefficiency when traffic is intermittent because the time slots is still allocated even when the channel has no data to transmit. For example, the TDM says, okay, well, I reserve a channel for data, a channel for a voice and a channel for video. But if the data is not, hasn't got anything to send, it's just gonna go empty, that slot. Well, that's a problem, that's inefficient. So for that reason, we have invented, or they have invented statistical time division multiplexing. Statistical time division multiplexing uses the variable time slots length allowing channels to compete for any free slot space so now we have a different time slots and then the channels that will compete they will find their own time slots so they will we will never have a time slot empty it employs a buffer memory that temporarily stores the data during periodic of peaks traffic SCDM does not waste a high speed line time with inactive channels using this scheme STDM requires each transmission to carry identification information or a channel identifier. Demarcation point. The demarcation point marks the point where your network interfaces with a network that is owned by another organization. So your network interfaces with another network. So demarcation point, what is really what you can explain is uh, where the responsibility your responsibility starts and where your responsibility ends demarcation point where the responsibility of the service provider starts dte and dce from the point of the view of the connection to the wide area network a serial connection has a dte device at one end and the connection and dc device at the other end the connection between the two dce devices in the wide area network service provides the transmission in this example, the customer pre uh, premises equipment, which is generally a router, is the DTE. DTE. The DTE could also be a terminal, computer, printer, or fax machine if they connect directly to the service provider. So in the wide area network, you really there's two DTEs talking to each other. And you have the service provider who will provide the DC or the clocking. So the clocking always goes on the service provider equipment. This probably is a like a CSU DSU device that will provide. You send the, the data to there. The service provider will convert the data acceptable format from them and send it to the other side of DC and the other side of DC will convert it back to your format of the DTE. The DCE, commonly a modem or CSU DSU unit, is a device used to convert the user data from the DTE into form acceptable to the wide area network service provider transmission link. Serial bandwidth. In North America, the bandwidth is usually expressed in as a digital signal level, number, DS0, DS1, and so on, which refers to the rate and format of the signal. The most fundamental line speed is 64 kilobits per second, or DS0, which is the bandwidth required for uncompressed digitized phone call. Serial connection bandwidth can be increments increased incrementally increased to accommodate the need for faster transmission. For example, 24 DS zeros can be bundled to get the DS1 line, also called T1 line, which is a speed of 1.544 megabits per second. Also, 28 DS1 line can be bundled to get the DS3 line, also called the T3 line, which is a speed of 44736 megabits per second. These lines are available in different capacities and are generally priced based on the bandwidth required and the distance. OC transmission, optical carrier transmission rates, are a set of standardized specification for the transmission of digital signals carried on sonnet fiber optic networks. The designation used in optical carrier followed by an integral value representing the base transmission rate of 51.84 megabits per second. So optical carrier, we have OC1, 
has 51.84 megabit, megabits per second. When I was studying, I was thinking optical carrier is like a year and the bandwidth is like weeks. So when you think one year has 52 weeks, optical carrier one has 51.84. So on the exams, for example, if they tell you uh, what is the optical carrier of uh, three, for example, then you can think, okay, well, three years times 52 weeks per year, that's 155 megabits per second to get to the closest. HDLC encapsulation. Wide area network encapsulation protocols. On each wide area network connection, data is encapsulated into frames before crossing the wide area network link. This ensures that the correct protocol is used. The appropriate layer 2 encapsulation type must be configured. The following is our short description of wide area network protocol. HDLC, this is the default encapsulation type on point-to-point -point connections, dedicated links, and the circuit switched connection with the, uh, when the link uses two Cisco devices. HDLC is now basis for synchronous PPP used by many servers to connect to the wide array network, most commonly the internet. So HDLC is the default encapsulation if you are connecting to Cisco devices. Then we have a PPP or point to point protocol provides a router to router and host to network connections over synchronous and asynchronous circuits. PPP works with several network layer protocols, such as IPv4 and IPv6. PPP uses the HDLC encapsulation protocol, but also has a built-in security mechanism such as PAP and CHAP. So PPP, point-to-point -point protocol, it uses different kind of network layer protocols, so you can use any network layer protocol. IPv4, IPv6, IPv question mark, whatever new IPv we have, PPP is, is ready. Then we have a serial line inter internet protocol or SLIP, a standard proto protocol, a standard protocol for point-to-point -point serial connection using TCP IP. SLIP has been largely largely displaced by PPP. Then we have a X25, which is legacy protocol, we don't have it anymore but has been there before frame relay. Now X25 is a protocol that had lots of headers because uh, the cables at that time, it wasn't no up to the standards. So it lots of error correction and error detection, but it has been replaced by frame relay, which is an industry standard switched data link layer protocol that handles multiple virtual circuits. Frame relay is the next generation protocol after X25. Frame Relay eliminates some of the time-consuming process such as error corrections and flow control employed in X25. Now Frame Relay is the next chapter. Then we have an ATM, the international standard for cell relay in which devices send multiple service types such as voice, videos or data in a fixed length of 53 bytes cells. HDLC encapsulation. HDLC uses synchronous serial transmission to provide error-free communication between two endpoints. This is a standard HDLC uh, frame format, supports only single protocol environment. So we have flags. HDLC defines a layer two framing structure that allows for flow control and error control through the use of acknowledgements. Each frame has the same format, whether it's a data frame or a control frame. Now Cisco has developed an extension to this HDLC protocol to solve the inability to provide a multi-protocol support. So C Cisco has came out from the standard, they made their own HDLC, but they added the protocol field so because before HDLC could not, it did support only one protocol, while now it can support multiple protocols. Although Cisco HDLC, also referred to as small c HDLC, is a proprietary Cisco has allowed many other network equipment vendors to implement it. Cisco HDLC frame contains a field for identifying the network protocol being encapsulated. Okay, now we see what's, what is in the frame, HDLC frame. First, we have the flag field. This initiates and terminates error checking. The frame always starts and ends with the 8-bit flag fields. The pattern is as you see it on the screen. Then we have the address. The address field contains the HDLC address of the secondary station. This address can contain a specific address or group addresses or broadcast address. Now, destination address is not that important on PPP because it's like a tunnel. One entry, 
one exit point. So you're always going to arrive at the destination. Then we have a control field. The control field uses three different formats depending on the type of the HDLC frame being used. First, we have an ident information frame or iframe, carry upper layer information and some control information. Supervisory frame or S frame provides control information. An unnumbered frame or U frame supports control purposes and are not sequenced. Protocol field only uses the Cisco H it's used on the Cisco HDLC. The field specify the protocol type encapsulated within the frame. Example, a 0x0800 is for IP. And then we have a data field. And then frame check sequence. The FCS pre, uh, precedes the ending flag delimiter and it's usually a cyclic redundancy check CRC calculating reminder. The CRC calculating is redone in the receiver if the result differs from the value in the original frame, an error is assumed. Now this is a, just the error detection. There's nothing, there's no correction here. If connecting non-Cisco devices, use synchronous PPP. If the default encapsulation method has been changed, use the encapsulation HDLC command in privileged exec mode to re-enable the HDLC. There are two steps to re-enable the HDLC encapsulation. First, step is to enter the interface configuration mode of the serial interface and then type encapsulation HDLC command to specify what encapsulation you are using. Show IP interface serial 0 forward slash 0 forward slash 0 it gives us quite a bit of information. The output of the show interface serial command displays information specific to that serial interface. What we can see from there is the layer 1 information is up and layer 2 or protocol is up, it's functioning. When HDLC is configured, encapsulation will say HDLC to reflect this. If you have PPP, then it will say PPP encapsulation or frame relay. Both sides of the point to point link has to, they have to match. When we do show IP or show interface serial 00, 0, 0 forward star 0, forward star 0, we will have six possible states. The first state is the, the best state. That's the one that we really like to see. Serial X, whatever it is, is up. Line protocol is up. That means the layer one is up and layer two is up. So really, you don't need to do anything. Everything is fine. The next possible state will be is where it says serial in question is down. Line protocol is down, right? So here, there's a few problems. It could be the cabling is faulty or incorrect. You know, you have put it upside down or whatever. There's a problem maybe with the CSU, DSU device. Swap the faulty parts. The third possible state could be it, the layer one is up, but layer two is down. Now, this is a bit more challenging to, to find out what is the problem. A local or remote router is misconfigured. Don't think always the local computer. Maybe the remote computer has a wrong uh, encapsulation. Keeper lies are not being sent by the remote router. A timing problem has occurred on the cable, which means the serial clock is not being set. The clock rate interface configuration command is missing. The next possible state is not often seen. Uh, layer 1 is up. Layer 2, it says it's looped. So you find out that a loop does exist on the circuit. And the way we can find this loop is by sending a sequence number in the keep alive packets change to random number when a loop is initially detected. If the same random number over the link comes back, then the loop exists. Again, less likely to see is serial in question is up and line protocol is disabled. Here is a, a high error rate has occurred due to the wide area network service provider problem. A CSU DSU hardware problem has occurred or router hardware interface is bad. And the last state that we can see is administratively down and protocol is down. Now this, without me telling you, you should know that you have forgot to do no shutdown. The interface is administratively put down. That's the default on the routers. Or it could be the duplicate IP addresses exist. So if your duplicate address exists, then the router will shut down the interface for you. I mean, this will drive you crazy 
if the duplicate address exists because you do no shutdown and then the router just put that interface to shut down administratively down show controllers serial zero four star zero four star zero i mean this in command what we do it here is trying to find out are you the dc do you need to configure the clock or not so right there the third line tells us are we dc or not and at this time yes we are the dc and the clock rate has been configured if the electrical interface output displays the unknown if we don't see the unknown then uh, or some other electrical interface type the likely problem is in properly connection table so you have not connected the cable properly okay so if you follow the link uh, this is I'm gonna configure now a packet tracer activity 3127 troubleshooting a serial interfaces and now please thank you very much for watching and uh, please don't forget to subscribe and the next video coming it's 3.2 PPP operations thank you very much and goodbye